Thank you for watching the Tank Museum's YouTube channel and don't forget to subscribe. If you can support the museum, please think of backing us on Patreon or joining one of our membership schemes. Or if you watch to the end of this video, you'll be able to see how you can help the museum by buying items from our online shop. This tank chat is going to be about the Soviet era tank, the T-72. And what a story it is with the T-72, because we're looking at a tank that sees service with now over 40 countries. It's still in use all around the world. About 20,000 of these tanks have been made. Now, we've already talked about the Soviet philosophy post-World War II, how they wanted to use tanks, what they thought they were there for, and if a war had come, um, the way they were going to use their massive tank fleet. So I'd suggest, if you're interested in knowing about that, look at our previous films on the T-54, T-55, and also the T-62. But the T-72 story is really a story that is based around a tank that unfortunately we don't actually have here at the Tank Museum. That's the Soviet T-64. Now, if I take you back, um, the Soviet Union has at least five major tank plants post-World War II. And within those tank plants, there's a number of design bureaus. And these design bureaus uh, end up having what you can only describe as rivalries. You know, they want their tank, their designs uh, to get into service with the Soviet army. Now, what happens is Morozov, who's Alexander Morozov, he's the main designer who works at the big Kharkov tank factory. And he's been influential because he's been part of the T-34, then the T-44 that leads to the T-54 design team. And he comes up with a tank that is called the T-64. And the T-64 is a bit of a breakaway from the usual Soviet tradition of tank building. Instead of evolution, making their tanks slightly better on the same sort of basis, maybe the same engine, maybe the same transmission systems, but just getting better, what he does is he does a radically new vehicle. Now the T-64 as that new vehicle, um, it has uh, a new suspension system, it's going to have the 115 initially millimetre gun that's on the T-62, but they're aiming for it to have a new gun that's in, uh, on its way, the 125 millimetre gun. And Morozov is very keen to get the T-64 as, as small and as lightweight and as compact as possible, and he's going for advanced technology to help him do that. So they get a brand new engine, and inevitably there's problems with the T-64. But Morozov has a, a, a large following, mainly in Moscow, of uh, Red Army generals, influential people who believe he's the man for designing tanks. Now, the Red Army, or from 47, it's actually called the Soviet Army, the Soviet Army, there's people within it, some really like the T-64 because they believe that their forces should have the most advanced equipment and should be heading towards technology. There's other elements in the Soviet army that are thinking the T-64 is a bad idea because it's going in the wrong direction. They've got a mainly conscript army, they've got limited, to a certain degree, limited budgets here and there, and we've gone for something, you know, with a, an engine that at this particular stage early on in its process, very unreliable, the mobility of the tank that is, is supposed to be better. Actually, it's having problems with its transmissions, its tracks, it's breaking down a lot. And for many of those soldiers in the Soviet army, they're not going to know that the new armor protection that they've been putting on the T-64 is very sophisticated. It includes a laminate. Um, so all in all, there's, there's some mixed opinions within the Soviet army itself about the T-64. Now, playing on this, a rival design bureau that's placed at Nizhny Tagal, which is basically in the Ural Mountains, um, with its chief designer there, Leonard Kartsev, he looks at, they are slated to start having to build the new T-64 tank. They are already busily building T-62 tanks. Now, initially, he looks at the T-64 and thinks he can make some simplifications and improvements on it. 
and later he ends up using some of the ideas for the T64, but some of these improvements he's coming up with, but he puts them on the earlier T62 chassis. Now in 1967, he's visited by one of the senior ministers from Moscow in their factory at Tizny Nagal. And what happens there is he's basically lambasted by this minister. Look, you're setting up a rival project. You're just scheming. You're doing all the wrong things. Um, and Kartsev says, hang on a second, calm down. Let me just show you what we've been doing. And he shows off his new design. And the minister is absolutely impressed because, for example, what Kartsev managed to do is get a new autoloader that is very smooth in its operation. The T64 has an autoloader that's having a lot of teething troubles. Um, and Kartsev shows off what he can do with also a traditional development of the original engine, you know, the V44 that we were seeing back in used in T34 and in the T54 as a developmental process, because he knows there's a lot of problems going on with the T64 engine. So he puts that to the minister and the minister before leaving, after one moment, absolutely slamming up this project, you know, this is not what we're, the way we want to be going. He then agrees before leaving that they can make six test vehicles to see how this project might advance. And uh, uh, Kartsev, quite rightly, is he's calling this, they end up calling it Object 172 Ural, because that's where um, Tizni Nagal is as a place uh, in the Ural Mountains. So he wants to identify this as our project, our tank, this particular project. Now in 1969, when these five vehicles are actually demonstrated or trialled um, in front of a number of experts and people from the Soviet Army, when they're actually shown off for the first time, it's obvious that the vehicles with the most improvements, uh, with most of Kartsev's ideas on it, they are the ones that come out best. And in the end, what happens is the Soviet authorities decide that this is a tank that is worth actually pursuing. So in 72, they approve it officially for service. 74, it starts going into limited production as a T-72 tank. Um, so why is that? If the Soviets already got this T-64 going, um, which again as a tank is very sophisticated, um, 67, when the first project is shown off, is one of those indicators about why they end up going for another tank as well. 1967 is a year where there's the big Arab-Israeli fighting and the Arabs basically afterwards go from the Middle East to the Soviet Union to ask for tanks. So 67, that crucial year, starts seeing the Soviets not only providing tanks for their own army, for the Warsaw Pact, but now for an export market as well. And there is nervousness in the Soviet military hierarchy that the T-64 might take five or maybe even 10 years to get all these problems ironed out. So we've got numbers and serious productions because again, as we've talked about earlier, the Soviets also want, they don't just want that quality, but they want large numbers of tanks. And T-64s are having a very problematic uh, gestation period initially and then in terms of production. So even though they're going against their own sort of theories, um, you end up getting the T-72. At one point, it was being called things like a mobilisation model. In other words, we'll only build them if we look like we're going to go to war or something. But hook or crook, they end up getting it through and the T-72 starts going into production in those early 1970s. So what's the difference? What do you get with the T-72? Um, a T-72 in its first basic iteration, it's got a three-man crew. So you've got the driver down at the front of the vehicle. He's got a tiller steer system in that traditional way. He's got a periscope above him and he's got two smaller periscopes that are actually fitted on his hatch that uh, goes above his position there. Um, he's actually got an escape hatch as well underneath his seat, just at, behind it, um, should he get out. But, uh, you know, various people say you've almost got to be a contortionist to get through that escape hatch. In the turret, there's uh, two further crew members. You've got the commander and the gunner. And the idea here is, as with the T-64, they've looked at the idea of if we can make 
the tank as low a profile as possible, you're less of a target for the enemy to hit. And they also want to make it as compact as possible to keep the weight down. In the end, they're aiming for about 40 tonnes. It comes in at about 41 tonnes in the production models. So the idea here is by losing the loader who has to stand up to ram the ram ammunition into because of the weight of it, they end up with the same as a T-64, a carousel system, um, which carries 22 rounds. And this is done on the horizontal plane. What happens is below is the ammunition, the projectile that's going to be fired above is the, um, the casing with the explosive in. That's carried above in two two panniers and they move around very quickly. It can go about 70 degrees of its circle in eight seconds. So that's very quick to then have a two motion movement where first of all, the ammunition round is rammed into the breech followed by the charge, which is rammed in. And as part of that process, if there's a stub casing from the charge from the previous one, that's ejected out and there's a hole in the roof at the back of the turret that that goes out of. So they can get the firing operation done in about eight seconds, um, which again is very impressive for an auto-loading system. If the auto-loader breaks down for any reason, they can hand-crank it, but then you're ending up getting about uh, only two rounds off a minute rather than the eight rounds using um, the actual carousel system. Um, it is a very, very compact turret inside there. People often, if you climb in one, certainly Western tankers, if they get in a 272, they can't quite believe how compact it is. People describe it much more like a cockpit um, with the two crew members squeezed down either side of the gun. I mentioned the fact 22 rounds in that carousel. Other rounds are carried in almost like cubby holes around inside the vehicle for reloading that carousel and uh, the commander sits on two boxes of ammunition for um, the heavy machine gun that's normally placed outside on the commander's cupola. And again, differences between the T-64, which had a remote control weapon system on the turret, actually this one, they're trying to simplify with the T-72 some of the ideas from the T-64. Um, so that gunnery system, the gun has to go to level for it to be able to be loaded and they did try and design it so this tank could fire this huge 125 millimeter it's called a dt 81 t gun in the early models they wanted to be able to fire it while the tank is on the move the truth is unless you're on very level ground uh, and only going below say 20 kilometers an hour which is about it's just under half its actual top speed um, the chances of you firing accurately on the move are pretty useless now, very early T-72s have a traditional type of rangefinder in it. Later, a laser rangefinder is fitted. But the gunnery computer, the system using this, actually the gunner has to input things like weather conditions, wind, etc., uh, and the ammunition type. The only thing the gun actually, uh, the computer does for the gun, is in terms of stability, actually feeding that into a gunnery computer there um, before the gun fires. Three main types of ammunition fired by this 125mm gun. So you've got armour piercing, discarding sabo, um, rounds are being fired out, so metal darts um, coming out that way for firing at other tanks. You've got high explosives fragmentation, or basically high explosive rounds for firing at infantry, etc. in the open. Um, and they also do a heat round, a high explosive anti-tank, in other words, a, uh, basically a, a hollow charge type round as well. So this gun, when it goes into service at 125 millimeter, you're looking on the T-72 and on the T-64, the largest gun that's in service uh, anywhere in the world at the time. So it's a very, very impressive bit of kit with that gun there as well. Um, the commander, he's actually got the machine gun in front of him. There's a PKT bar, uh, machine gun in the turret as well, coax leaf to fire. Um, again, he has a cupola that gives him 360 viewpoints. But the truth is, again, T-72, when compared to many other tanks, the visibility from a closed down vehicle once you're inside it is very, very limited. Um, so, you know, it is not a comfy tank. And, you know, officially 
the Soviet army at the time went up to about five foot nine for tank crewmen, etc. If you are five foot nine, even that sort of height, you're going to find it very compact in there. There is no way you can stand up in the turret. It is very, very small because of that lowering of the profile. Um, Torsion bar suspension, big rubber road wheels you can see here. Um, again, that same aggressive track that you'll see on the other Soviet vehicles, so you don't have rubber track put on there. And as with so many of the Soviet production vehicles, very quickly improvements start coming along the line. So the original T-72, very quickly we get the T-72A, where extra armour is being placed on the front of the turret. When NATO observers saw this extra armour, which almost gives a vertical front to the, uh, rather than the sloped rounded edge to the early T-72 turrets, that vertical armour, they nicknamed it Dolly Parton after the rather well-built country, American country singer. Um, later, um, when the B model comes out in the 1980s, there's, there's even a super Dolly Parton as even extra armour is put on the front of that turret that way. So these are things that NATO were using to recognise the different models of T-72 tank when they're going into service. Now, those improvements mean as well that uh, we get a more powerful engine is put in the back during its service life and with the T-72M is basically they're doing an export model. Sometimes they call it the M, this is an M by the way here, made in the Soviet Union but actually exported to Warsaw Pact countries. They do a T-72S model which is a variant of the T-72A. The S model is for sales around the world and as a rule of thumb those vehicles that are meant for Warsaw Pact or selling on do not have the same specification in terms of armour, quality and thickness as do those vehicles that are destined for the uh, Soviet army at the time. Um, but this is an export success for the Russians. In the 1970s, I mentioned this idea that uh, the Middle East in particular, but other countries are coming to buy the T-72. And in the 1970s, 44% of the hard currency earned by the Soviet Union is coming from tank sales. Um, the only other thing that beats it is raw materials that they're selling at the time. So this idea of another one of the reasons why sometimes the Soviets have got more tanks in service, so even as they're making the T-62, the T-64 and the 72 coming in, they're still making some of those T-54s because they're mainly going for export at the same time. So this idea of the parallel models in service so again, the Leningrad tank factory comes up with basically a souped up version of the T-64. They put a gas turbine engine in the back. That becomes the T-80 in the middle of the 1970s. That leads to a new turret on this new T-80 tank. The T-72, the B model, is basically a souped up version of the T-72 using some of that technology that has been, so it brings it up to the same standard as that new T-80 tank. So this is a vehicle that, as I've said before with these Soviet tanks, goes through not just a number of major changes, but it also goes through a huge number of changes where it goes out and is manufactured locally. So Poland, Czechoslovakia, they do their own versions, manufacturing. Um, Iran, Iraq war, these are being used and they're being sent out in kit form to being assembled. Um, so there's variations about what's being made. You know, at one point there's about six different countries either assembling or making T-72 tanks. And their own development stories tend to go on into very different patterns as well, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1990. So you'll see the Polish T-72s are almost unrecognisable later. Uh, they call them Twardy. But, you know, it's a whole other, same as the Czechoslovakian ones, etc. It's almost a whole other story looking at those national variations that were built on T-72 chassis. Now, I mentioned this one's an M. It was actually one of the ones made in the Soviet Union, given to the East German Army, and at the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, a number of those vehicles were left behind in East Germany and they were distributed, some went into service. Again, this particular one, it was passed on by the, uh, the then Bundeswehr to the Tank Museum, so we're very lucky. We've got a number of T-72 here. And again, when you look, as I mentioned, each of them has those slightly different features. Um, very distinctive, though, when you look at it, especially compared to the other tanks around here, is that low profile 
the very deeply sloped glassy plate at the front there, the V bow wave uh, in front of the driver to stop water just coming straight up. It actually tries to push water back as it's doing that way. But those also those lines coming up, they're also to stop bullets hitting the front and skidding up towards where the driver might his head have his head out the hatch as well. Um, stowage and fuel down the sides as we can see and on this particular one as well we've got the 81 millimeter smoke discharges either side this vehicle can still put uh, diesel onto its hot exhaust and make those big smoke screens in that traditional manner and also we fitted here that deep wading snorkel that we've seen on those earlier tanks going back to the T55 so that again that idea if they're coming up against river obstacles or waterways with some preparation, they can deep wade across. Um, you're pretty nervous doing all that, as you can imagine, because I believe it's about six or seven seconds if you stall the engine before you can get it going, or otherwise you're going to flood. Um, so it's something the Soviets did train a lot about, was trying to do river crossings, but not over the water, going under the water using a, a snorkel system. You can see the infrared sight on the side here, uh, on the right hand side as I'm facing forward. Again, as part of those sophisticated improvements, a new type of 125 millimeter gun is put in. And at the end of the 1980s, for the first time, they're actually being able to fire a missile, which then extends the range of this gun out to about five kilometers. So it's called the Sphere missile, SVIR and that missile system is fitted to uh, in the end of the 1980s and as I've said on other models some of these T72 goes back to the factory to get upgraded to a newer standard which makes it even more complex trying to tell the different models apart as they're going along. Um, what happens in 1982 is an American uh, built M48 used by the Israelis. The Israelis have put some of their new uh, explosive reactive armor, Eero it's called armor, those blocks uh, of armor blocks that are put on the outside of this M48 tank. It's actually captured by the Syrians and quickly handed over to the Soviets. The Soviets have already started designing their own version of an explosive reactive armor, but when the Soviet army generals see this in use in the Middle East, see its advantages, they insist that the new armor, reactive armor that the Soviets have come up with is actually put on the vehicle. So from 1983, you'll start seeing T-72 tanks going into service with what they call contact armor on. And they're those little blocks, about 227 blocks per tank to protect the whole vehicle. And the whole idea, the principle there is for hollow charge rounds and later with contact five, it actually has a, a good effect against kinetic rounds as well. Basically what's happening is when it's hit, there's a sandwich of steel uh, and explosives and that when detonated will help uh, stop an incoming hollow charge round hot jet that's coming forward and as I say with the contact five it also helps uh, uh, slow down as it were or um, lessen the effect of a kinetic charge a solid, solid round that's being fired at the tank and those types of improvements you'll see go on vehicles uh, throughout the 1990s. Soviet Union collapses in 1990, but uh, you, they are still doing some production vehicles for sale and some versions are still going into service with the uh, Soviet army at that time as well. So a vehicle that is now in service uh, all around the world, about 20,000 I was saying was, was being made in the first place. Um, so this is a vehicle when we're talking to British soldiers here, when we're doing the training sessions, etc. This is the vehicle I say that they are most likely to meet in uh, around the world on their service days because there are so many of them out there and they spread you know, first of all, we just say about the Middle East, but then it was, uh, of course, it was the ex-Cold War, the Warsaw Pact countries. Um, but then it's now they've gone to South America, they've gone to the Far East, they've gone to a, such a huge number of places. So uh, still a very credible piece of kit. And with uh, so many vehicles with modern upgrades that take this from a second generation tank all the way further forward, um, you know, this is a vehicle that is still a real threat. And as we said about those earlier Soviet tanks, it's a very, very real threat if you don't have your own tanks either. So that's another thing that we try and uh, bang on about all the time is yes, a, uh, at the height of the Cold War, a NATO tank individually may well have been a better one against one against the T-72, but 
actually a T-72 in a country where there's very little armour to fight against, this is going to be the biggest threat there. And again, sheer numbers mean that something like a T-72 could have swamped a better quality NATO tank, which is another thing that the Russians were thinking about when they were building these tanks in such large quantities. So a vehicle we're going to see carrying on and improving, carrying on going through rebuilds, carrying on having upgrades, and undoubtedly, again, another one of those Soviet tanks that will be in service for decades to come. If you're interested in the T-72 tank or other Soviet-era vehicles, do have a look at our online shop. We've got a range of books such as this sort of thing, our Haynes Manual on the T-34 tank, um, a series of books on the subject. You can also see behind me here a big range of different types of models. So if you're a model maker, we've got everything from simple wooden ones you can put together right the way through to the more sophisticated end of the modeler's market. So take a look at some of those ones there. And if you are going on to the shop, have a look. We've got all those usual things we'll be selling for Christmas. If you buy from us, of course, that money helps us as a charity keep going and it helps us be able to produce online content such as we're doing here. So think about things. If you're going to buy someone a present, we've got our Christmas jumper. We've got a calendar for next year with all images from the collection. We've got jigsaw puzzles. We've got beer. We've got a range of items there. So have a look. Please do try and buy something and support us so we can carry on doing what we're doing.